particular birth at or where an idea comes from. But, um, you know, this, like um, the sermon this morning, it's kind of crazy sometimes when, when God will kind of hit you with something. But we were at, um, actually at the nursing home with Brother Barney Sunday night. And me and Brother Kyle and Karen were standing out in the hallway. And Brother Kyle started talking about the walls of Jericho falling. He was talking about something else. Not exactly, you know, what I talked about this morning. But that, that just kind of hit me. That sermon just kind of came into my mind. I told Kyle, I said, man, you just gave me a great idea for a sermon, you know. And I know God sent it to him. And then Brother David, he was talking about this morning resources, and he was just simply talking about, you know, using, you know, the index in your Bible to be able to find where you need to go um, in your Bible, you know, just it's sitting right there whenever you need it. And so this is kind of, that's kind of where this was kind of came from this morning. And so um, the title of the sermon tonight is Opportunity Knocks. Opportunity Knocks. Because I want you to understand something tonight. I want you to understand something. It is very valuable. Time is very valuable. It is the most valuable thing that you have, is time. And opportunities, most opportunities have small windows. They, they aren't very big. And so, you know, you don't have a great amount of time, um, you know, just to, just to piddle around. You know, it's been said that killing time murders opportunity. Killing time, think about it, some of you will hit you on the way home, but killing time, you know, murders opportunity. In other words, if you drag around too long or you piddle around whenever you got an opportunity to do something, then before you know it, it's too late. You know, the opportunity's gone. You don't have that opportunity anymore. Because there's something inside of us, I don't know what it is, but there's something inside of us, you know, I'm trying to think about today, like, you know, this afternoon, like what it is and how to explain it, but I don't know exactly how to explain it or exactly what it is, but there's something inside of us that just seems to procrastinate or just seem to always feel like there's another day, there's another moment, there's going to be another chance. When in reality, if you think about it, we understand that death is, I'm telling you right now, death, I'm telling you, it's 100%. We're all going to die. You know, unless the Lord comes back, we're all going to die. Every one of us are going to die. It's 100%. And so we realize that. And then we also realize there's time frames on doing things. And, I, I mean, you know, you're like, well, even the IRS can give you an extension. Well, well listen, God's got a certain day. He's not going to give you an extension. God has a certain time. You know, maybe we're not even talking about death, but an opportunity in ministry an opportunity in your family, he gives you a certain amount of time. You know, even as a parent, sometimes you, you don't realize how short a window you have to teach and to pour into your children, you know, before they're out on their own, before you know it, they're grown. You always feel like, well, we'll start tomorrow. We'll do this tomorrow. But, you know, I hear in witnessing the people, talking to people in their homes all the time, you know, well, I know God's been dealing with me about getting my family in church. Well, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying, but they haven't gotten into church yet. But God had been dealing with them about it. So they have an opportunity to go do it, but they procrastinated. So there's something inside of us that just feels like, you know, tomorrow will be there. But it not always is. And we know that for a fact. So tonight, I just want to kind of deal with that. I want to deal with opportunity knocking, you know. And so we're going to go to a familiar set of scripture tonight on one that most of you have probably heard who have been around church very long. So if you would stand with me on the reference to reading God's word tonight. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, and tempted him, saying he's testing him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him something he never would have thought he'd heard in a million years. This may not blow you away, but it's blew this guy away and everybody around him. He said, he said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, Jesus said that's the first and the greatest commandment. Your heart, mind, and soul. Is yourself. So he will say, This do and thou shalt live. But he willing by himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? You know, I don't know exactly how he said that, but it sounds kind of smart out of it. I mean, I don't know. He's trying, he's trying to trap Jesus is what he's trying to You know, but he says, And who is my neighbor? They were always trying to trap Jesus, but Jesus, he, Jericho, part of leaving him half dead, a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on by the other side, he and looked on him, passed by on the other side. When he saw him, he had and wounds pouring in oil and wine and said, 
on the mark. He took out two pence and gave it to them to host and said to him, Take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more than when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. And Jesus took that question, turned it around on him, and asked the question. So now he's on the hot seat. He's the one that's got to answer. And he said, I mean, what else could he say? What else could he say? Anybody with any kind of brains would understand that situation, that, that his, the one that did the neighborly thing, the one that did the right thing, he said, and he said, the one that showed mercy on him. Go and do likewise. Lord, open up your word, open up our hearts, but most of all, God, bring glory to your name tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. See, see, sometimes it's about perspective. Sometimes it's about perspective. Sometimes it's even not about the situation changing. Sometimes it's about perspective. And that's what I prayed and that would change would be your perspective on some things and that would change my perspective on some things and that even though a lot of us have been around for a long time, some of us are, you know, are y'all new and that's awesome. Y'all bring in excitement. But I just really wish that as people that have been saved and been around for a while, that God would give us a different perspective on things because sometimes your perspective, the way you look at it, can completely change how you react and what you do. Whenever you look at a situation, there was an Italian shoe manufacturer and he wanted to expand his business. He made casual beach shoes, like sandals, you know what we call sandals. And he wanted to be worldwide. That was his dream, to be worldwide. And so there was this market in the Pacific and it was these nine islands where millions of people live. And so he wanted to tap into that. And so he got one of his veteran guys who had been doing it a long time and been very successful. And he got one of his veteran guys and he sent him out there. And he sent him with, you know, a small order of sandals to go out there and try to, you know, talk people into buying some of these sandals and kind of tap into the people that were living there. Well, he went out there and these, these people were in villages and he got out there and on the, he got to the first island and he seen all the people out there, not one person had on shoes. Not one person had on shoes. And he thought to himself, there is no way. He thought to himself, why in the world, how can I convince these people that, you know, to, to buy these shoes? They don't even care about shoes. They don't have shoes. And so, you know, he called his boss and he said, listen, boss, he said, I, I'm just going to come back. He said, I'm not even going to really try to do this because um, none of these people have shoes. There's no way, you know, that uh, we're going to be able to tap into this. We're better off just to, to go back to the people we're already selling to and try to increase our orders there instead of branching out. And so he went back. But the boss man, there was just something inside of him, you know, that in his crawl. You know how sometimes just things get on your mind. And so he said, you know what, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to send a new guy who just started. And so he sent a new young guy that had just started, didn't have all the experience, didn't have none of those things. He got out there, and the first thing that the young guy called and said was, wow, man, listen, we have this great opportunity. There are all these people, and none of them have shoes. None of them have shoes. Look at all these customers sitting out here walking around on these islands. None of them got shoes. And so he went on to the next island. And when he got to the next island, there were nine of them. He got to the second island. He called his boss. He said, listen, boss, the whole this island, nobody's got shoes either. There are beaches everywhere. There's these shoeless people. There's a great opportunity. He said, I'm going to go on to the next seven islands. Well, he went to the third island. And after that, he wasn't going to be able to contact his boss for a while. But he got over there, and what he, you know, had decided to do, his, his train of thought was, I'm going to go to the main people in the village. I'm going to go to the main people around, and I'm going to try to get to know them. I'm going to try to get to, you know, them to know me and build a relationship, then sell them these shoes, show them these shoes, try to get in that way with them. So he found the main chieftain that was over all the islands that was at the third place that he went, and he just kind of hung out around him. And it come a time of year they were celebrating something. They were supposed to give gifts. And so... What the chieftain gave him, some fancy something. He gave the chieftain, all his chieftain, his chieftain's wife and his, the chieftain's kids, he gave all them shoes. And so little did he know, he started to explain. The chieftain come back and asked him, well, what do these do? How do you use them? And he showed them. And he said, you know what? He said, these things will protect your feet. He got to looking because he lived with them every day and he seen their feet were bruised. They had foot infections all the time because they had no shoes. They're walking around with no shoes. Little did he know that the chieftain's daughter had died from something she got as a foot disease the year before. And so he called, I mean, he just went and stayed down there with him, lived down there. He was gone for months. His boss man thought he died. 
he thought he'd done got, you know what I'm saying, you can imagine your mind going to a village somewhere, these remote islands, you were the boss man, you think he done got burned alive or they eating him or something down there. Well, it was just like months go on and then he reports back, he calls back just months later to his boss, he says, listen, he said, I got this great news. He said, you're alive, man, that's great news. He said, no, 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 listen, I've got great news. He said, I've got an order for a million shoes. A million shoes. A million shoes. He sold a million <coughs> shoes because the chieftain wanted everybody to have shoes so they wouldn't die like his daughter. He said, but that's not all. He said, I can't, go, I can't work for you anymore unless you use me here because the chieftain loved me so much he gave me a second daughter. And we're about to have a kid. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you think about that story, and I know you, you're thinking, man, that's just kind of a different story, but think about it. One guy looked at all those people without shoes, and what did he see? He seen an impossible task. He seen something that could never happen. But little did he know that it was all already worked out that when a young guy came along, he just looked at it differently. Same people, same situation. He looked at it as an opportunity. And see, as Christians, sometimes we are that way. Sometimes we get bogged down in, in what we've always done. Sometimes we get bogged down in our comfort zone. I don't mean necessarily what we do at church is what we've always done in our services. I'm talking about as individuals. That's the main thing I want to focus on tonight. Your comfort zone, you know, things that go on. When you look at this situation, when you look in Luke 10, and you look at when the Good Samaritan went by, you know, the preacher had done come by, the scribe had done come by, and then here you go, this Good Samaritan comes along. This is an awkward situation now. I don't know if you read that first verse or two out there that I read, but this guy, he went down there and the thieves attacked him. They stole his clothes. They took his raiment. That's his clothes. So you're thinking, why didn't they stop and help him? Well, you walk up to a bloody naked man on the side of the road, what you going to do? I mean, I'm just being honest with you. It's an awkward situation. Not to mention, if you do the detailed study and you look at it, the Jews and the Samaritans hated one another. And, and so a Samaritan, the Jews thought of Samaritans, they thought a dog was better than Samaritans. So here he is speaking about this to this, this Jewish lawyer, and he's telling him that this good Samaritan, this guy that they hate, this guy that they think nothing of, stopped and helped and had mercy on this guy. It's an awkward situation. People didn't like each other. They didn't get along. It wasn't what normally was done. And, and so, he, but he took the time, and he stopped, and he did just not what the average person would even do. He didn't even just stop with just helping the guy to get to the hospital. I mean, he took him to a place and he bound up his wounds personally. He got dirty himself. He personally, listen to me now, he personally helped him with his problems. That's a key point in the whole thing. Is you personally helping somebody with their problems. Listen, there are two main things that most of the time that when you do this for a while, you see that reach people. There'll be people that you try to take the gospel to that are unreceptive. But there's two avenues, there's two things that God has provided us with that are really great tools. One is things that people love. Things that people love. You know, people love sports, they love this, they love hunting, they love that. You know, just like last week, what did we do? We took something that people love and used it to try to reach people with the gospel. That was something they loved. But the other great thing that you, most of the time you can reach somebody with is you need to look for needs that they have in their life. People's needs are a great avenue to take the gospel to them. And see, you can look at that as a problem. You can look at that as a, a bother. Seeing that man beside the road, seeing that person that has a need. That man was in dire need. I mean, he was in need of help. I mean, he, had, he I'm telling you, he was just laying there, almost half dead. It just said half dead. He's almost dead laying there. He's in great need. So what did the Samaritan do? He helped him with his needs. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something that naturally happens between someone that is in need and someone that helps them with their need. You form a bond and a love that just cannot be explained. You hear what I mean? There are, people that, there are people that help me in my life. Let me tell you something. When somebody really helps you, I'm not talking about, you know, when you have some little shallow thing that you're doing that really don't mean anything. I'm talking about when you're in great need. When you're like this guy and you're stranded beside the road, ain't got nothing to your name, ain't nobody wanting to stop and help you with anything, nobody wanting to be around you, you know. It may be this guy, he was just going from point A to B, what really something he did to get in this tight, but it may be sometimes somebody has done something themselves to get themselves in a tight, and they're in a place, a bad place, maybe they've done something stupid, they've done something wrong, maybe they fell into some sin, they've done something crazy. 
I don't know, but I'm telling you, they're in need. And let me tell you, people avoid people with need. That is what human nature tells you to do. You're, everything inside of you is telling you not to go there. But what God says is, listen, he used this. Jesus used it. When he talked about being a neighbor, when he talked about the second greatest commandment, the greatest being love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. You know the first thing you need to do tonight is get right with God. Love God and follow God. But the second thing you need to do is take care of your neighbor and love your neighbor. And he used this as a great example of loving your neighbor. Helping someone in need. Let me tell you something. You can so reach people with the gospel when it, and it's an opportunity, man. And I'm telling you right now, I mean, that is a valuable opportunity. There's three B's I want to talk about tonight. The first point is the valuable opportunity. And we have a great opportunity now in 2016 for, to try to help meet the needs of the people in our community. Try to help meet the needs of the people in your own life. And I'm not just talking about a church. Let me tell you, as a church... You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about personally going and helping people. How much of that do you do? That's where you gauge that at. Jesus is going to hold our church right here in Walkerville accountable for what we do as a church. But let me tell you something. He's also going to hold you accountable personally for what you do as a neighbor. What you personally do. And I mean, sometimes it is writing a check. Sometimes it is calling somebody else that can help them when something you might not can help them with. But I'm telling you, a lot of times we do that because we don't want to get personally involved. But God has provided us with a great opportunity, a valuable opportunity. The second thing he's given us is a voice. We have a voice. Look in Luke 16. Look in Luke 16. Let me tell you something. This right here ought to wake you up tonight. This ought to wake you up tonight. It says in verse 23 in Luke 16. It says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. This is talking about a rich man. Rich man, he, this guy, this guy didn't choose to follow God in his life. I don't know if he's a bad guy or not, I don't know, but he, was a, he had everything in his life you could think of in this world, but he didn't choose to follow God, he didn't give his life to God, so he ended up in hell. That's just an easy, simple way to put it, he ended up in hell. He lifted up his eyes in hell, and being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom, Lazarus was the beggar, on the, I mean just the beggar right there by the gate. Lazarus, the guy he knew that even though he didn't have nothing in this world, he followed God. So Lazarus didn't go to hell. This guy went to hell. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime. See, we all got one life to live. It's so personal tonight, it, it ain't even funny. He said, listen, he talked to the rich man, he said, thou in thy lifetime, thy lifetime, he says, receivest thy things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and now are tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. There's a permanency about it. There's no more opportunities. That valuable opportunity that I was talking about is gone. It's gone. Listen to what he says. Neither can they pass to us or would come for an end. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into his place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. See, here's the thing right here. Here's the thing right here. I want, you to, I want you to listen to this verse that I'm fixing, these verses I'm fixing to read in 2 Corinthians. You can turn if you want to. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It's real easy. Just go to your right. Just go to your right. It's right there, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read you some verses from this. But listen to me. We use these verses, we use one of these verses a lot of times when we're preaching, and we use it in a way to, to let lost people know. And when I'm saying it, probably most of y'all that are saved in here, you're sitting there amen in what I'm saying. All right, listen to me. And we feel like this is something, you know, that lost people need to hear. You know, we try to tell them, hey, now today is the day of salvation. The time of salvation is at hand. It's right now. You know, you hear, ever heard a preacher say that? You may not have another opportunity after today. This is it. This is it. 
You understand what I mean? When you talk about provisions, like what Dave was talking about this morning, you talk about we have a valuable opportunity, but you also talk about we have a voice. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 6 says. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored them that behold, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. Listen to what he goes on to say, though. A lot of times, you don't read those verses under that. This is what he says. Given no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as ministers of God in much patience and afflictions and necessities, and stripes, and torment, watching by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth of God, by the righteousness on the right hand, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. And then he says, O ye Corinthians. See, get what this verse, get who these verses are written to. This is written to the church. This is written to us. See, not only, not only, get this now. I, I'm telling you, the greatest need in our hour is not just for lost people to understand that now is the time of grace. Now is the time. It's the day of grace. It's the age of grace. When you can come and give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and Him have grace and mercy on you. Now is the time. Not only do lost people, but the greatest need is not just for lost people to get that. The greatest need is for the church. The greatest need is for us as individuals to get that. To understand that not only is there a short and a opportunity for them to be saved, but there's also a short opportunity for us to witness to them. Don't you get that if you flip to the other side of the coin and you think about the people that are taking the gospel that we only have a short amount of time that we're dealing with. I'm telling you, we're dealing with a deadline. Don't you understand that we still have a voice? Don't you understand that we're not like that rich man in Luke 16? We're on this side of the grave that we can go tell our brothers, that we can go tell our neighbors, that we can go tell our families. You understand that we can go tell our co-workers? Don't you understand that we're not in the permanency of eternity, that we're still in the, the life that we're living and in time, and we've got beats in our heart? I mean, we've got breath in our lungs, so we have a voice. Listen, we have a valuable opportunity to go out and witness. We have needs upon needs. We have people, you know, things that they love that we can tap into. We've got all kinds of ways and, and avenues to serve, but we also, we have a voice right now. We are blessed with the provision of a voice to stand up in our generation and to still have time to go and tell them about the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And not only do lost people need to understand that they may walk out of them doors and never have another opportunity, but you as a saved person need to understand you may not wake up in the morning and the day may have been the last day that you had a chance to present the gospel to the people that you love so much. There's going to be no redos in, in eternity. There's going to be no extensions. There's going to be no other time. There's going to be no other opportunities. When they hit the end of the road, it's a dead-end street that ends in the herd of hell. But let me tell you, we've got a voice. We've got a voice. You've got a voice. You have got, I mean, I'm telling you right now, such a beautiful voice to speak such beautiful things to people. Golly, golly, listen to this. This is what Matthew Henry said about these verses. He said they must work and must work for God and His glory. Listen to this. For souls and their good, and they are workers with God, yet under Him, as instruments only. See, you're worried about what you're going to say, but you're just an instrument that God's going to play. Well, I didn't even make, think about that rhyming, but it did, didn't it? I can't say it again, LaDonna. I can't say it again. I'll monkey it up. I'm going to leave it right there. But listen to me. We're just instruments in the hands of God. It's up to him to do the playing. It's up to him to do the saying. It says if they be faithful, they may hope to find God working with them and their labor will be effectual. I want to say that again. If they be faithful, they may hope to find God working with them. If they be 
faithful. And the question of the night, the question of eternity one day when you're standing there looking God in the eyes and they're like flames of fire and you see the pureness and the holiness and the justice of God in the way that God did what He did in condemning sin and the wages of sin being death and in setting the standard there and the, and the mercy and the grace of God when you see the scars upon His Son's hands where He hung that cross that we've heard preached about all our life, we get to see the results of it on the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ as you stand there and you look at a nail-pierced Son of God and you see the burning, flaming fires in His eyes and you know the holiness and the righteousness of God the question of the day is, have you been faithful in sharing your son? That's going to be the question of the day. That's going to be the question of the day. And the gospel itself, the gospel itself calls us, just in what it is, calls us to be evangelistic and to take the provision that God has given us. All you need, all you need, listen to me, is an opportunity and a voice. And you've got it. There's no excuse, there's no reasons. You have got it. Listen to me, the third thing is, we got a valuable opportunity, we got a voice that we can use, and we got a vision. We got a vision. I'm going to tell you something, and I'll close out with this, but I'm going to tell you something. When we were at the Georgia Baptist Convention, one thing that I just absolutely loved that they're doing this year and that they, they, they want to emphasize is just old way of doing things. Just simply, just simply this. We talked about discipline in the church today at 5 o'clock class and I was listening because some of the stuff kind of overlapped and was the same. But listen to me. All that, what, what they want to do is they want to do a thing called the big invite. The big invite. And what, what it basically is is they want to have the most people they've ever had in church to hear the gospel at Easter on our Easter service. You understand, you understand what I mean. Sometimes we knock around on things, you know how people are. We talk about CEOs, you know what I mean? A lot of CEOs in church, Christmas and Easter only. Come on, you get what I'm saying. You're going to see people at Christmas, you're going to see people at Easter that you ain't seen the rest of the year in church. And see, what I love about it is they just simply, what they want to do is their goal is to make a million, to invite a million people to come to church on Easter. I think that's great. They call it a big invite. And let me just tell you something. Here's the vision. Here's the thing. Here's, here's the idea. You know, it's not only the accepted time to be saved, but it's also the accepted time. It's the right now to invite people to accept the greatest gift ever given. Do you know we ain't got to wait till Easter? You know we can do a trial run at Christmas. You just think about this. Think about this idea in my mind. And I know, man, my imagination, it, it just kind of runs wild with me sometimes. But here's the thing I imagine. Here's the thing I would love to see. Some people see this differently than I'd see it, but I'd see this as something beautiful. I'd love to see us invite so many people, and so many people come to our Christmas service. See, we only have one service that day at 10 o'clock. You know what I mean? That morning at 10 o'clock, we're going to have church. I'd love for us to invite.